Welcome back everyone. So we're very lucky to have an afternoon full of Nati. <laughs> Let's see what he has to tell us. Yeah, so I'm very sorry. Uh, I have you for uh, the remaining, I think what's until 8 p.m. What's uh... <laughs> Okay. Uh, but we will take a break <laughs> or two. Um, Actually, can we take two breaks since, uh, since it's entire, or do we have to stick to the uh, to Let's the schedule? Try to stick. We'll stick to the schedule. Okay. <laughs> you tell me when to stop, and yeah, I'll stop. Okay. Um, um, so uh, thanks. Uh, what I'll be uh, talking about this entire afternoon uh, is uh, it, things that have been already came up uh, in this workshop quite a bit, and this is the uh, the sometimes implicit. Uh, biases introduced by the optimization algorithm that are, even though are maybe uh, phrased in, ter in just minimizing the, the, the training error, minimizing some objective, are actually uh, in inducing a lot of uh, very helpful biases into the, into the system. And just to uh, motivate well, what we mean by that and why that's important in deep learning, um, we'll see some slides that we actually already saw today, uh, not today, but this week. Um, I think that some version of this uh, uh, plot already appeared uh, this week. And what we see here is uh, the training error and test error for uh, training uh, on MNIST uh, data, uh, training uh, uh, the uh, uh, neural nets with increasing size. And what we see is that as we, as we use uh, larger, net, larger networks, the training error goes down to zero, eventually it reaches zero. But what should be a bit maybe surprising here is that the, the test error continues decreasing well past the point that the training error is already zero. Okay? And so looking at this, and I should say that the way this was trained was just by minimizing the training error. Okay? Uh, and what should be surprising about this is uh, two things. One thing is that this continues going down. So why is this continuing going down? It's not going down because we're approximating the, 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 the data better. So if it's going down, it's probably because we're finding solution that's better in some other sense. Okay? And so what other sense? I mean, it seems that, that um, there's some kind of uh, implicit thing going on here that's uh, uh, when we have larger and larger networks, it's biasing us or into a solution that are, are better in some sense. Uh, the second thing we should be surprised here is even if we just look at a single point here, like I think around uh, um, 1,000 networks of, uh, with 1,000 here, there are already many, many more parameters here than uh, training data points. And so over here, there's absolutely no reason that our, by minimizing the training error, we'll be able to actually fit, we'll be able to generalize. Uh, I mean, we, we really should be, what we should be expecting is this to shoot way up, okay? And so even just to focusing on a single point, we should ask why is it that the optimization here actually finds a solution that, can, that uh, generalizes? And this is, um, so I said we saw this uh, uh, earlier, this is not in some sense a new phenomena. Um, a similar type of thing uh, was, uh, is, was observed in boosting. Again, I think we saw this uh, plots earlier this week. And also boosting was in initially understood uh, in terms of finding a sparse predictor, a predictor that only uses a small number of uh, uh, weak uh, classifiers. Um, and so the kind of generalization ability was uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the sparsity, in terms of that's kind of the explicit bias there is, you know, how many um, weak predictors I'm using. Uh, but when you actually run boosting, you see that even if you're using many, many more, you continue running boosting and you're have, using many, many more uh, weak predictors, much more that's actually needed in order to fit the data. So you're not getting any better data fit here. Uh, the test error keeps decreasing. Um, and so what's going on here, again, there's something else that's not explicit in the optimization algorithm, and I'm viewing here at the boost is an optimization algorithm, and that's actually driving what's going on. And this has been uh, understood in a series of papers uh, starting from uh, a seminal paper uh, by uh, Peter and, and co-authors in uh, 1998, uh, which showed that what's going on here is that what we're doing uh, when we're continuing running boosting is we're increasing the L1 margin. So this is a plot that we already saw, the L1 margin after uh, the distribution of the kind of the, the mar margin after, so this is the L1 margin after five iterations and after 100 and 1,000 iterations, the, we get increasingly larger and larger L1 margins. Uh, and so the, the explanation of what's, uh, the, what's going on here, the reason we're getting better generalization is because some complexity control is improving, in this case, the L1 norm. Okay? And so if we go back uh, to our uh, plot from the first figure, um, and zoom in on what's going on. So this is only the, I'm not plotting here the, the training error because this is where the training error is already zero. Um, 
then we can say, well, maybe there's some complexity control, kind of maybe analogous to the L1 norm in, uh, uh, in boosting, that actually is being uh, decreased as we uh, increase the, the width. And in fact, you can kind of uh, come up with various complexity measures. What I'm plotting here is the path norm. I'm not even going to tell you what it is. It doesn't matter. It's not the right thing that's going on here. I mean, you should view this more as a, a cartoon. You object? I think uh, Venom agrees, right? <laughs> okay. I mean, we since have some other suggestions. I don't, I don't want to get into that. Uh, but the point is that we, we expect kind of to find models that are becoming more and more, they're, they're becoming more complex in terms of number of units, but they're becoming more and more simple uh, in terms of something else, like maybe the, the path or maybe something else. So one question we could ask, and this is not the main question we're going to ask in this tutorial at least, is what is this complexity measure that's actually controlling generalization? And that was addressed a bit in uh, uh, Sasha and Peter's uh, tutorials. We discussed in various ways that we can ensure generalization for uh, networks, even with number of units is much, much bigger than, uh, number of parameters much, much bigger than, than the number of uh, training points. But the question we're going to ask here is a bit of a different question. So again, if we focus on this uh, uh, networks with the width 1,000, uh, then uh, what we're finding, we're running, so the way we train this, uh, Venom, how did we train this? It's gradient, do you remember? <laughs> Just uh, mini-batch mini, mini gradient, mini gradient descent on the training objective until convergence, okay? Uh, and so what we told the optimization algorithm to do is minimize the training error. And it did minimize the training error. It found the global minimum of the training error. How do I know I found the global minimum of the training error? So it's so zero, okay, it's definitely global minima. Okay, so the optimization algorithm did what it's supposed to do. And what it found is a solution that actually generalized well, a small test error and also had small uh, path norm, okay? So now the question is why did it do that? So as we said, there are many, many more parameters here than training points, so this is not the only global optima. There are many global optima. Many of these global optima do not have small path norms. So now I'm gonna plot several other global optima. Each one of those red dots corresponds to a global optima. So if my optimization algorithm outputted any one of those red dots, I would not be able to complain. It, the optimization algorithm did what it was supposed to do. It found a solution with zero training error. You know, zero and then also training loss, it's essentially zero. Okay? But yet, um, not all of these points have small uh, path norm. In fact, these global minima all have very high path norm. And in fact, they also generalize horribly, suggesting that maybe the path norm has something to do with generalization. Okay? And then I could get the same thing if I plotted some other complexity measures here as well. Um, so, the real question we're going to ask is, what, why is it that our optimization algorithm actually did something that seems kind of sensible, and what does it mean even to be sensible, and we turn this, this global optima, which is a good global optima, and not these global optima, which are bad global optima. And, and, and note that, that maybe what we're going to focus a lot is, what does it mean to be a good global optima? So when you think of it in terms of optimization, a good global optima, what's a good global optima? A good solution is a solution that has small objective, in particular, global optima is good, that kind of definition, okay? So and what does it mean to be good global optima and bad, bad global optima? All of these are equally good in terms of optimization. They're all doing a job in terms of optimization, but there's some other properties, some implicit properties that are not specified when we said, okay, minimize this training objective, that are actually, um, that they're different between them, okay? So how is it that our optimization algorithm, you know, what is our optimization algorithm implicitly doing, and how is it doing that? In particular, if we said that the choice of, yes? So what is the path norm? As I said, I don't want to answer that question. I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's the, I mean, if you ask the answer, it's the sum over all path, computation paths in the network of the product of the weights along the path, I think in this case squared, okay? I mean, it really, for the purpose of, of this, it doesn't matter. It's some measure of uh, magnitude of the weights in the system, okay? Yeah, so, yeah, Vitaly? So my, my duck is these two points that there is a zero training error and the implicit uh, and the fact that we're using maybe some implicit uh, notion of complexity, these are not, these are two unrelated phenomena. Like the fact that you, there is some, uh, you could, you might as well keep no, improving. No, they're not, they're not unrelated in the sense that if there is a unique global minima, and so if the problem was not, so this is an underdetermined problem. So it's in the title slide, I think, I think the title of my talk was something like arithmetic bias in underdetermined systems. So what's important here is that the system is underdetermined. If the system was overdetermined, then generally speaking, there would be a unique global minima. And then if I tell the optimization algorithm, minimize the, the, the training objective, it would not have any flexibility in what it does. There would be only one good answer, one correct answer, which is a global minima might be this, exactly the same situation, just with a uh, training error not being zero. There is no, uh, you can achieve. No, the, the, you're right that, the, okay, no, just a second, second. You're right that the important thing is not whether the training error is zero or not, 
the question is whether there's a unique minima or not. The thing is, in, in general, okay, for systems in, in general, so think of, you know, and we'll get to that specific example later, think of a, a least square problem in general position. Okay? For a least square problem in general position, either there is a unique global minima that's, in non, that's non-zero, or there are many global minima that are all zero. So you're, you're right that I can con contrive all kinds of situations. Wait, is that what the statement I said just said is correct? Yes. Yeah, okay, right. Okay. You're right that I can have all kinds of situations where there are various degeneracies so that there are many, glo many, minim many uh, global minima that are not zero. That's fine. Okay? I, I mean, I, I, uh, then, then that, these uh, reasons will apply as well. But I think you're implicitly optimizing. You're saying that you're implicitly optimizing some balance between two. Methods. No, I didn't say balance. You said balance. What I'm saying is I'm not, we'll see later on whether it's a balance or not, and we'll talk about that. But right now, there's no balance. I'm minimizing the training error, and among the, solu among the global optimum of the training error, okay, the, all of these are, uh, there's no balance between these. All of these have a zero training error. Among the solutions with the zero training error, I'm selecting between them one that has maybe small path mode. You can do the same thing with, uh, among those that have 50% training error. Like, nothing would change. Like you could define among solutions that achieve. But I'm not. But wait, 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 wait. Okay, this is this is an important thing that I think will come up later. You're saying, well, I could have used a completely different procedure, and explicitly done something, done all kinds of figuralization and choose kind of things and done balance. The question, I, we're, we're, one of the things we're going to talk about today, one one of the kind of things today, is not, and this would do, this would be a relevant question to ask for almost everything we're going to show, because for almost everything we're going to show, in fact, we're going to show it explicitly. There is an explicit way of achieving the same thing. In fact, one of the, the goals of what we're doing is the thing that's happening here explicitly, we would like to have an explicit procedure that does it. And so, but rather, our, the, what, the way to kind of interpret this talk is that a talk that doesn't, at this point, not a talk that, that starts with a problem and suggests a good solution for the problem, but the talk that starts with a solution, what people actually do, Okay, so that's a given. What people actually do in this case is minimize the training error. Okay, that's what we did here. Okay, that's what Benham did. He just minimized the training error. You can't change that. Okay, and now we're trying to understand what actually happened when you do that procedure. Okay, sure. Okay. That, that, that's what, what I'm saying is just it's true that you can do it uh, with, in this context, but like it's not the, the only way to investigate the same implicit regularization, right? It doesn't have to happen in zero. It's not the it's, it's, implicit regulation can be started without the zero loss, without the zero loss. <coughs> so implicit regulation is a very broad thing, and in fact, we'll see, we'll explicitly talk about it also in non-zero loss. Yes, well, you're right. You can maximize margin in... But, but okay, so we will in fact talk about uh, non-realizable cases and cases where you don't have zero loss. We'll talk about all this. But the, 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 the phenomenon I'm talking about here is a phenomenon where you have zero loss. Okay. I, I'm still, I'm not sure what the objection is. I have to okay, admit. Okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, sure, offer. So how did you obtain the other minimizer? Ah, that's a good point. That's very hard, okay? So you might think that what we did here is instead of using, um, you know, batch gradient descent, uh, we used some other really bad optimization algorithm. Uh, however, it's really difficult to get, you know, any, any optimization algorithm you can think of would actually fairly sen be fairly sensible and would get, maybe it wouldn't get this point, it would get points that are kind of over here. So you have to really put in a lot of effort to get these points. So hard. the way, what? It's not that hard. It's not that hard. Well, a, I mean, you know, it's, it, it's, if you want to just have a, to, to design a, cent, you know, a natural, it's hard to do with a natural optimization algorithm, okay? So what we did, I don't know, maybe. Uh, it's natural. I mean, you're going to tell the solution. Yeah, I'm going to tell the solution. It's a natural algorithm. That you well, it's not, a, okay, it's not an algorithm you'd ever use at home. So what we did <laughs> is, okay, so imagine you're, you're telling me, you're calling, I'm the optimizer. You're calling, you're giving me a training set and telling me, find this, the global optimum on this training set. And they will return to your global optimum on this training set. The way I do it, remember that I have many more parameters than, than your training points. I'm gonna collect a bunch more points from the distribution and label them incorrectly. And then minimize the training error on the points you gave me plus this confusion set. I'm gonna get something that has zero training error on, the, on your training set plus the confusion set. In particular, it also has zero training error on your training set. Then I'm gonna return it to you. It's a perfectly valid global minima for your training set. But it's, it's really bad, okay? So again, in that sense, it's not like a natural optimization. It, you, I, I hope your code, your optimization code doesn't actually do that, okay? <laughs> um, right, okay, but, but, but we'll get to know in my natural algorithm. Maybe I'll, I mean, this is supposed to be just a, a, <laughs> an intro motivation. I didn't even start the talk yet. 
I think we are going to be here until 8 p.m. Okay, so the, the, <laughs> the point is that uh, what we're going to look at is what, what, I mean, how does optimization algorithm actually select this one and not these horrible ones? In particular, if we change optimization algorithm, okay, we're going to change this, this implicit bias. We're going to have different solutions and, and they're going to have different generalization properties because we're going to maybe minimize something else. So maybe we're not going to get these horrible ones. And now maybe to ask off this question, now we try different reasonable algorithms and see what we get. Um, so this is, we try two different algorithms here. I mean, one is standard SGD and the other is you know, approximate uh, steepest descent with respect to this path norm. It doesn't matter. Just think of it as the blue algorithm and the red algorithm. Okay? So we run the blue algorithm and the red algorithm on the training objective, which is the, the multi-class logistic regression loss, these days called the cross-entropy loss. And, and uh, what we see is that both of them actually find a global minima, okay, zero solution. Maybe the blue one a bit faster, but it doesn't, that's not so important. However, when we go to the, to the test performance, we see a big difference between them. Okay? So the, the, both of them found a global minima, but the blue, they found different global minima, and the blue algorithm found a better global minima. And this is consistent around, among training sets and among all kinds of different uh, variations here, which you know, with dropouts, without dropouts, and I'm going to talk about this. Another comparison is, again, a blue algorithm and red algorithm. In this case, the, red algori the blue algorithm is, st is stochastic gradient descent, and the red algorithm is Adam. It's stochastic gradient descent with momentum and uh, adaptive, uh, uh, adaptive uh, per coordinate step sizes. It doesn't really matter. Just think of it as a red algorithm and a blue algorithm. In this case, if I just, this is, if I'm an optimization person, I'm only looking at the left hand uh, plot here. And the left hand plot actually suggests the red algorithm is better. Okay? It's, it con it's converging faster. In fact, they did and they should have extended. Eventually, they're going to reach the same uh, uh, training error. And uh, the red algorithm is finding that uh, minimum training error faster. But the solutions are, the, 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 the optimum, now I can't, I'm not completely sure it's a global optimum, I'm pretty sure it's a global optimum, that it's converging here, is, uh, that it's converging to is actually worse. In what sense it's worse? In terms of optimization, it's, it's just as good, but it's generalizing what much worse. Okay? It has worse generalization. So it seems the implicit bias of these two optimization algorithms are different, which is leading to completely different generalization properties. Okay? So, when I'm, uh, um, so the general uh, thing we're seeing here is that if you think of the, the optimization landscape, there are many global minimums. It's over -determined. All of these problems are overdetermined. So if we, fit, if we use neural networks we use today have, you know, are, are way overdetermined. They generally have many, many more parameters than, uh, than training examples. So there are many global optima, many zero error solutions. We're optimizing the training error, but what's really important is not just that we're optimizing the training error, but which of these global minima you're going to get to. In fact, what I would argue is that uh, the networks are, we're using are, are large enough that conceptually you can think of them as infinite size networks. Okay? They're, they're close enough to infinity. In particular, they can represent all functions. Okay? And, and, and I can say that because at the very least, they can represent all functions on your training data. And you know, I think it's correct to think of them as really you can represent all functions. So just limiting the fact that you use a specific model does not actually constrain your model class. So in, the, in uh, Sasha and, uh, and Peter's tutorial, the, uh, the focus was when you define some model class, you define some you know, hypothesis class, and you learn by, you, you gain generalization by limiting the capacity of this model class. But the model class here is all functions. So that's not how we're, we're uh, uh, gaining uh, generalization. Instead, uh, what I argue is that we're, we're finding a particular, uh, a, a particular zero error solution. So you just think of it this way. Uh, the, you have your landscape, you have way over parameterized problem. You have lots of zero error solutions. These are the oceans. Okay? And you're going to start optimizing somewhere. So where are you going to get? You're not going to get in the middle of the ocean. Right? You're not, you're gonna, because your optimization is going to kind of be, uh, all our optimization procedures are essentially SGD or, or variants. They have some local optimization procedure. You're going to get to a beach. Okay, there's zero solution on the beach. Okay? But which beach? So if you start optimizing in Berkeley, and you go down, you're going to you're gonna start optimizing here, you're going to get to the bay. Okay? Uh, if you start optimizing in Boston, you're going to go down, you're going to get to the Massachusetts Bay. The question is, what happens if you start optimizing in Chicago? Okay? So Chicago is really flat. You can get anywhere, and the rivers flow backwards, and you can get like, you know, you, in the, the now that really depends which way do you, does your optimization algorithm prefer doing, going. If your optimization algorithm prefer going, prefers going north-south, or prefers going south, you'll get to the Gulf of Mexico. If your optimization algorithm prefers going north, you'll get to the St. Lawrence. Okay? And so if your optimization algorithm prefers going east, then with some difficulty, you'd get to the Atlantic Ocean. Okay? So it's really, it depends what are the biases of your optimization algorithm. The biases of optimization algorithm will determine which solution you're going to get to, and that will really determine your, the, the behavior of a model. So let's, I mean, maybe this seems abstract and you don't believe me. Let's see it in a very concrete problem, which we can actually understand. Um, Yes. You know, maybe I'm reading 
much into analogy. Are you saying that if you start too close to the optimum, then it wouldn't matter? Or are you saying that... If you start too close, uh, maybe, but are, um, maybe we'll save that question okay. when we talk about uh, it, it then, okay? But, uh, okay? Okay, so let's, uh, uh, let's think about the problem. So neural nets I don't understand, nobody understands, but there's one problem I do understand, that's matrix factorization, okay? Uh, in particular, matrix completion. So let's think of a matrix completion problem. So a matrix completion problem, it's written here in the more general form, is kind of reconstructing a measurement, uh, a matrix uh, W based on linear uh, measurements A, but if these linear measurements are just indicators, you can think of it as a matrix completion. You have observed some of the entries uh, uh, of the matrix, and you want to complete the rest of the entries. So we can think of this, uh, we're going to write this as this uh, um, uh, least square problems where we have uh, our observations. We want to minimize the error. What our training objective is going to be, just minimize the error in the observations. Okay? And W is going to be all possible matrices, n by n matrices in this case. And of course, matrix completion is interesting if you have much fewer observations than, than, uh, than parameters. Right? You have n square parameters, and I obviously am going to have only see part of the entry. So I have m, the number of observations, is much, much smaller is it written here? Okay, much, much smaller than the, uh, the number of parameters. Okay, so this is the problem we're going to solve. Okay, so if I solve this as an optimization problem, this is a really stupid optimization problem. How would you solve this optimization problem? Hmm? Picking on you? <laughs> Seb, how would you solve this optimization problem? What? What? You put zero everywhere. Yeah, you put zero. Okay, the easiest thing to do, you, put, you just put... Um, you put zero everywhere on uh, the non, uh, non-observed entries and complete observed entries, you got zero solution. So it's very easy to solve this optimization problem. Okay? This is, of course, not the only global optimum. There are many global optimum of this optimization problem. Okay? Uh, you can complete the observed entries and put the Fibonacci sequence anywhere else, complete the observed entries and put 73 everywhere else. I mean, there's lots of global optima. Okay? The question is, which global optima are you going to get to? Okay, so if you do this and you're going to grant any sin on W, you're actually not going to get to a very interesting global minima. Uh, but to get to something interesting, what we're going to do is we're going to change our model without changing the model class. Okay, so again, we're going to emphasize here how the model class is important, but, but the model is important not because of the model class. So what we're going to do, this problem doesn't make any sense. It has way too many parameters. We're going to do exactly what we do in deep learning, which is we have a problem with way too many parameters, so we're going to make even more parameters. Okay, so we're going to over, over parameterize this. Instead of having n squared parameters, we're going to have two n squared parameters. Okay, so we're going to write w as u times v. Okay, so now we have n squared two n squared parameters, u and v are full dimensional, they're both n by n. I did not limit my model class at all. I'm talking about exactly the same model class because all the, func all the matrices w I can write as u times v. In fact, I can write in u times v in many different ways, right? I can write w times identity, identity times w, and a bunch of other different ways, okay? So this problem is just as stupid as the previous one. There are many different global minima. Seb's global minima is perfectly valid, and you know, all the other global minima are, are also valid. Uh, but nevertheless, we're going to take this completely stupid global uh, problem, and we're going to solve it with gradient descent over, over u and v. And the question is, what happens? Okay? Um, so I think many of you at this point have seen it before. So what happens is as follows. So what we see here, uh, we're comparing uh, two things. This is uh, gradient descent on the original matrix W. So this is the, the kind of not very good, uh, interesting thing of doing. And this is gradient descent of the factorization. So again, this is the same optimization problem solved in two different ways. The training object, uh, error in both cases is zero. We fit the observed entries. Big deal. It's very easy to fit the observed entries. What should be more surprising is that the test error, so in this, you know, how well we're doing in the unobserved entries, is very different. If we just do this, the gradient descent on matrix W itself, then the test error is, as we expected, really horrible. We, we're not, not doing anything. But if we actually do gradient descent on U and V, then we actually get pretty good performance, pretty good pre test performance. So we actually succeed in actually reconstructing the metrics. And I should say that, I mean, this works because the metrics itself had actually some structures and there's simulation and approximately in approximate low rank metrics. But note that the model itself doesn't know this. I didn't actually limit my search to, to low rank matrices. Okay? But nevertheless, uh, just by, by the fact we're, we're optimizing over V, we manage actually generalizing well. Okay? So this is by gradient descent with exact line search. Okay? And now let's change optimization algorithm. We're going to change optimization algorithm to be a worse optimization algorithm. Okay? Which worse optimization algorithm? Instead of doing gradient descent with exact line search, we're, gradient, we're going to do gradient descent with a fixed small step size. In terms of optimization, that's a worse optimization algorithm. Put my optimization hat on. I did something bad because it's going to take me much longer to actually, con I'm still going to converge to a global minima. It's very easy to get to global minima. It's going to take me longer to get to the global minima. But in terms of generalization performance, this change of optimization algorithm actually led to better generalization performance. So, so roughly, you should think of these things as these, this is these points that were in the top right, the points that don't make any sense, they're really bad. Okay? They're global minima, but they're really bad global minima. This is actually 
global minima that are actually sensible, and now we change a bit of optimization algorithm, we get global minima that are even more sensible, that are better. So what's, you know, what's going on here? Can we, so, so again, so this is, I hope it, the connection to what we saw at the beginning is clear. We have a system that's completely uh, overdetermined. It's essentially the set of all functions. In this case, all functions meaning all matrices. Okay? So we're not limiting at all our model class. Nevertheless, just because the way we're optimizing, we're finding our optimization is leading us to a beach that actually makes sense. Okay? And, and so what's going on here? What is the beach that we're finding here? And in this case, we can kind of say what is the beach we're finding. And so we'll get back to that later. But roughly speaking, there's, there's some evidence uh, that uh, uh, what we're finding is the minimum nuclear norm solution. Okay? So what we plot here is also the minimum nuclear norm, nuclear norm solution. In this case, and we can see that this is a, the nuclear norm of different solutions. If we do gradient descent with small step size, we actually do find the minimum nuclear norm solution. Okay? Uh, and so, so in this case, uh, I would say that the implicit bias of the optimization algorithm, which is gradient descent on U and V, is given by the nuclear norm. Okay? So that's, and that's the part we're trying to get today. What is the implicit bias of the optimization algorithm? And then we know that that's a good uh, implicit bias because actually minimizing the nuclear norm if you, is a good way of recovering an approximately low rank matrix that we already knew before. Okay? And so what we're going to do today is try to make this connection between optimization algorithm and implicit bias. Um, okay, and again, I mean, going back to neural nets, I mean, what this suggests is, you know, I hope at this point I convinced you that actually optimization algorithm is important. That means that if you, uh, if you have, you know, the, the classic uh, structure of a uh, uh, learning paper, we come up with some model class. Uh, the model class is great. And then we say, well, how are you going to train on this model class? Well, we're just going to minimize the training error, okay? And so, and how do we minimize the training error? It's not important. We just use some, I don't know, something. It's the details in appendix or in the code or something else, okay? So what I'm trying to say is that your entire learning algorithm, your entire, like, inductive bias, your entire, everything that's going on, what determines which, mo what predictor you're actually going to find is not given uh, by your model, okay? Because your model likely can model every function, okay? But rather is given by the details of the optimization algorithm, okay? And so in order to understand what we're actually doing, we have to understand this, uh, uh, this connection. Okay, okay, good. So, uh, any question about before I start the talk? Okay, good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> do you need that review? <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, what we're going to do uh, in the first half, roughly, it's probably a bit more than half, uh, we're going to go and look at convex shallow learning, which we actually understand many of these things and understand. Um, Implicit bias in uh, uh, in uh, shallow learning will actually understand more broadly. So we're gonna what we're gonna emphasize is the connection between the optimization, the geometry of optimization, and the geometry of learning, and try to get a geometrical view of all this, and hopefully make you make it clear what I mean. And then we're gonna go to deep learning, and if we have time, which we probably won't, we'll probably also talk a bit about the kernel and deep regimes and how they affect implicit bias. So let's start with. Um, <clears throat> convex problems understand uh, in what um, how can relate optimization and learning uh, and a deep connection to optimization and learning for convex problems and the importance of optimization, particularly the, the, the geometry. What I'm trying to, get to try to emphasize in all this is really what's important is what is the geometry of optimization, that your bias comes from the geometry of, your, of the optimization. And I'll soon make it clear what I mean. Uh, but let's, uh, in order to understand that, let's just think of what is, what is learning. Okay, so what is the goal of learning? I'm going to focus specifically on supervised learning. The goal of supervised learning is just to find a predictor which has, which has a good expected error on the, um, uh, on, the, uh, on the population. And the only problem is we actually don't know the distribution of population. So instead, what we do, we collect a bunch of samples. Uh, and we can construct uh, uh, an empirical uh, uh, estimate for our uh, population uh, objective. And, uh, um, it, why is this not uh, showing here? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, and, uh, and then what we do is we minimize the empirical error. Uh, uh, the, I mean, instead of minimizing the population error, which we can minimize the empirical error. So this boils down to optimization problem. And now to ensure good generalization, we can either limit to some hypothesis class or add some regularizer. And really, this is usually what's you know, thought of as you know, the, the main kind of uh, 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 bias of learning. And I should say that I'm not going to distinguish too much between them uh, because adding a, oops, this should be psi, not phi, phi I'm sorry. This, you know, this is psi. Okay, so adding a regularizer is almost the same as constraining to sublevel sets of psi. So throughout the talks, 
it'll sometimes be easy, more convenient for us to talk about like restricting to sublevel sets of the regularizer and sometimes talk about uh, adding a penalty and minimizing the regularizer. The point is that much of learning boils down to solving one of these two problems, like uh, minimizing a, a regularized problem or a constrained problem where the bias is determined by this psi. So if I talk psi, it's going to determine our, our, our bias, or which later we'll refer to also as uh, optimization. And then how are you going to guarantee generalization? Uh, so if you were here for uh, Peter and Sasha's talks, um, a classic way to determine generalization is we can have we establish uniform convergence in, in the sublevel sets of psi. If we establish uniform convergence in sublevel sets of psi and we find a solution with small psi, then we know that our uh, population objective is also going to be uh, as good as our training objective. Great. So let's look at a concrete example. And the concrete example we'll look at is probably the kind of uh, um, uh, most straightforward example here is, is uh, roughly you can think of it as SVMs. Uh, this is uh, L2 regularized uh, uh, predictions. Our predictors are given by linear predictors in a very high, maybe infinite dimensional space. So again, we don't get much uh, inductive bias from, from uh, delimiting this, the, the, uh, just the linear predictors. But instead, uh, what we're going to do is we limit it only to predictors as small in, in Euclidean norm. So in this case, our sublevel sets are just Euclidean balls. Okay? And we're also going to assume here that the data is uh, normalized and our loss function is one Lipschitz, like you know, the hinge loss or logistic loss or something like that. Great. So um, what can we do? Well, in this case, if we, in fact, uh, uh, solve this ERM problem, uh, uh, then we minimize the loss inside, uh, uh, we find the predictor minimizes, uh, minimizing the empirical loss, as empirical risk minimizer, and now we can rely on uh, uniform convergence, such as we saw uh, in the previous two days, and the uniform convergence tells us that the empirical uh, error of W hat is going to clo be close to an expectation uh, to within something that, scale, something that looks like square root of norm squared over M, M is number of samples, and so we can guarantee that the predictor we find is going to compete with the best thing in our class, best thing with small norm, up to the square root of uh, norm squared over m. OK. Uh, so now the question is, how do we solve this optimization problem? We have an optimization problem. So we're going to talk about optimization. How are we going to solve this optimization problem? Well, we can solve it with gradient descent. OK. We'll just take uh, the gradient of the empirical. Oops. I now see my notation is going to change throughout the talk. This point. Okay, we're going to later call this LS, but for now we'll call it L hat. Okay, so we're just going to minimize our empirical objective. Um, uh, iteratively, sorry, minimize empirical objective by taking kind of batch gradient descent. And now we can ask, well, how long is it going to take us to optimize? Uh, and the number of, uh, uh, we can get you know, standard gradient descent guarantee. It tells us that after t iterations, we're going to be within square root of b squared over t close to the, uh, to the minimum of this empirical objective. So we're already seeing here that, look, we have the same quantities here and here. Oh, that's kind of interesting. But they're bounding different things. Okay? This is a generalization guarantee that comes from uniform convergence. This is a suboptimality guarantee on how close is the empirical objective that we're finding to the minimal possible empirical objective. OK. So this is gradient descent. Should we use gradient descent here? Yes? No? Come on. I was warned that the people are, are not very, uh, it's not very interactive. But I, I guess I can. So what should we actually use here? How would you actually optimize this? How do you optimize the empirical objective here? With SGD, thank you, Seb. Okay. <laughs> we, instead of gradient descent, of course, we should use stochastic gradient descent. So you use stochastic gradient descent. Advantage is now we don't have to look at each step only involves a single point and not the entire uh, uh, batch. Uh, so at each iteration, we just point, choose a point x i y i and perform a step just on that x i y i. And the important thing is that the, the gradient that we're using here is, a, or the gradient estimate we're using here is an unbiased estimator of the overall gradient. And the magic is that even if you use SGD in this case, we still have to just do the same number of iterations. So we saved a lot. Okay, this is still an optimization guarantee. Okay, now what we actually want is we're not actually going to find W hat. We're going to find this W bar T, like the, what happens after T iterations of gradient descent. And we're going to ask how well is this going to do on the population? That's what we actually care about because this is going to be the output of our algorithm and we care how well it generalizes. So what we can do is we can just, you know, we have two sources of error, the optimization error, which is given by this in the um, uh, uh, uniform convergence uh, uh, error, so the, the, the estimation error, which is given by this. We add them together, and we get that uh, overall we'll find a predictor that has excess error that competes with the best in the class with something like square root of b squared over m plus square root of b squared over t. Okay, good. So if you set t roughly equal to m, we're, we're good here. Okay, but uh, this is one way to approach this, but actually, we didn't have to do all this. Why is that? So what we did here is if you viewed stochastic gradient descent as a way of optimizing the empirical objective. But in, in another way to think about pretty much the same iterations is to think of stochastic gradient descent as the way of optimizing the, the population objective. After all, okay, every, um, what we need for stochastic gradient descent to work 
is that every, uh, every gradient estimate we're using is an unbiased estimator of the gradient of the objective. So it's true that each one of these points is an unbiased estimator of the empirical objective, but is at least if we use independent uh, samples at each iteration, each one of these gradient estimates is also an unbiased estimate of the population objective. So that means we can also US, view SGD as a direct optimization procedure on the population objective. Okay? And now we can apply the, the SGD suboptimality guarantee directly to the population objective. So we no longer need the, the, the uniform convergence guarantee. We directly see, I'm hoping that this is not very new to most of you, but uh, I still want to go through this carefully. We get directly from the, uh, from the optimization guarantee that the uh, suboptimality on the population uh, loss, which is exactly what we wanted. Okay? And, and, and the suboptimality is squared of b squared over t. And the thing is that this works only if we use each, each point only once, because we need independent samples each iteration. So the number of samples here is the number, has to match the, the number of iterations. Um, so t has to be equal to m, and we cover, we cover the exact same guarantee. Okay? So what did we actually do here? So, so first of all, we see that we can get, using an optimization algorithm, which is stochastic gradient descent, I, I just ran stochastic gradient descent, and actually this gave me the same thing as what I got by explicit regularization. Okay? So first of all, let's, let's try to, to take a step back and see what's going on here. What's going on here is that uh, if we think of stochastic optimization, what is stochastic optimization? So SGD is a method for, you know, for stochastic optimization. And the, the standard phrasing is stochastic optimization. We have an, an optimization objective. Uh, and, uh, and this optimization objective is given as an expectation or sum of our, uh, 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 over an instantaneous objective. And what we do at each iteration is instead of actually using the, the, the overall, the true objective, capital F, we just use the uh, unbiased estimators for it. Uh, okay? And, um, uh, and so we can think of the overall objective as the empirical objective, but we can also think of the overall objective as a population objective. So in particular, if you think of a, about our learning problem, so you said, what is our learning problem? Our learning problem was minimizing a, an objective, which is the, the error on the population. This is exactly a problem which is of the form of a stochastic optimization problem. Okay, so this is, a, I think, something very important to keep in mind, that learning on, a, on its that supervised learning, at least, is a stochastic optimization problem. Okay? So it's not that when you solve a learning problem, you, you solve a learning problem and then you use some optimization procedure to help you solve the learning problem, but the learning problem itself is a stochastic optimization problem. Okay? And so what we said, so, uh, so what we saw is we, well, it's a stochastic optimization problem, we just use stochastic gradient sin directly to solve it. Okay? Um, okay, maybe I'll uh, skip this, but you can also say that, you know, uh, here we saw that supervised learning is a special case of stochastic optimization. Um, you can talk about general learning, which is exactly equivalent to uh, uh, stochastic optimization. Um, uh, and, and so really, I mean, the, the, my main, uh, I was actually talking just uh, over the lunch break with Sasha, but at what point was this really understood? And d definitely um, when, I was, you know, when I was growing up, uh, learning and optimization was kind of studied as, uh, as two separate uh, things. And I think in the last uh, 15 years, they've been uh, merged uh, much more together through a very deep understanding that, I mean, at this point, I think that hopefully this is not like news to any of you that, that machine learning is a stochastic optimization problem. Uh, so the community has merged, and really at this point, the difference between them is mo mostly still boils down to notation. Uh, so we're going to uh, stick mostly with uh, the NIPS notation here of W. Um, and really, this is the same problem. OK, let me uh, skip this because uh, it took too long. OK, so um, okay. so let's go back to what we saw before. Really, uh, what we had is that we had two different approaches here. The first approach we saw is we solved an ERM problem, empirical risk minimization problem. And so we have to make sure that we actually limit ourselves to predictably small norm. Okay? We could do that by actually projecting all the time uh, to have small, to make sure we stay with this, uh, in the sublevel set. Uh, and then we used SGD in order to optimize the empirical objective. Okay? The alternative approach we saw that has almost the same iterations is when we say, okay, no, these iterations, let's just view them as stochastic gradient descent on the population objective itself. Okay? Um, and so there, the, the main difference between them is that here we need a first sample each iteration, and here we can separate between the number of iterations we have and the number of steps we have. We can may take more steps than the number of iterations. Okay? Point is we don't need to. Okay. In terms of uh, regularization, of in implicit versus explicit regularization, which is the reason why I'm showing you all this, is that um, here the regularization was very, very explicit. Our, our bias was very explicit. How we limit, how we get generalization was very, very explicit. We get generalization by restricting the L2 norm. Okay. So this is our explicit, uh, our explicit regularization, our explicit bias, and everything is kind of on the table. 
Over here, it's implicit. Where is this hiding here? I mean, I'm just doing stochastic gradient descent. In what way am I, you know, how, how am I actually regularizing the problem? I'm just searching over all possible linear predictors. There are too, way too many linear predictors. Okay? Somehow, the fact that I'm doing it with these specific updates allows me to get good generalization. Okay? Um, Hey, let's uh, skip this. Uh, and, and so we can do that by limiting. Another way to think about it is instead of doing uh, um, ERM on a, a constraint problem, this is maybe the more familiar form, we can also, it's also perfectly fine to, do, to look at the regularized ERM. So to, this also can guarantee generalization. But here again, the, the, so this amounts to doing weight decay. And again here, the, the regularization is very explicit. It's explicit here, it's explicit in the weight decay. Okay? And so it's, you know, we can get good generalization by virtue of you know, from convergence or stability or something like that that explicitly looks at this regularizer. Okay? Here, we, you know, this works just as well and we don't have that. So now, it's important to understand in this case, it's not that stochastic gradient descent actually finds the empirical risk minimizer or the, the regular empirical risk minimizer. Okay? What it does is just find something that generalizes just as well. Okay? So if you think about it this way, this is maybe the, you know, the best thing we're competing with, the, the, the best predictor, best low norm predictor, okay? the best on the population. Okay? So we want to be close to it. And with m samples, we can be squared b squared over m close to it. Okay? So we can be in some neighborhood of it. Okay? So ERM is somewhere over here. I mean, it's as good as we can get with m, with m samples to the, to, to the truth. Okay? If we run stochastic gradient descent, one pass stochastic gradient descent, it's not that we're going to get to the same point here. We're actually going to get to a point that's also squared of uh, b squared over m away from w hat, from the ERM. So we're actually going to be pretty far from the ERM. But we're going to be as close to w star, which is what we care about. So we get to within this neighborhood of w star. All these three points are about the same distance to one another. Okay? So the form of implicit regularization here is a bit different than, than what we saw before in the sense that it's not the implicit regularization, it's how we can say the implicit regularizer is minimizing the squared norm, okay, like we saw before that's minimizing the trace norm, rather it's getting generalization in terms of this uh, squared norm, it's achieving, getting us to the same neighborhood uh, of the predictor with, min with the, the regularized DRM or the, the predictor with small, uh, uh, with bounded L2 norm, okay? In okay, it, so is this, this clear? Okay, good. Um, Okay, so what we should uh, ask ourselves then is where is the regularization hiding in, in stochastic gradient descent? Why is stochastic gradient descent affording us regularization relative to the L2 norm, right? So what we saw is that the result of stochastic gradient descent will generalize as well as the minimum uh, L2 norm solution, okay? Or the, sorry, the solution with constrained L2 norm regularized to it. Why L2 norm? Why not L1 norm or nuclear norm or something else? I don't know, sparsity, okay? How is the, this, this in this bias towards small nuclear norm, this generalization ability in terms of the nuclear norm baked into stochastic gradient descent, or into gradient descent in general. Okay, so in order to see that, let's think of what, what is actually stochastic gradient descent. So what we do in stochastic gradient descent, gradient descent methods, we look at our objective and we look at some point and, and, and talk actually about gradient descent rather than stochastic gradient descent perhaps, um, and we use the gradient. What is the gradient? The gradient gives us a linear approximation of our function. Okay? In each iteration of gradient descent, we can think of it as minimizing a linear first order approximation, a linear approximation of our function, or affine approximation of our function. Okay, so if we just did this, is this a good procedure? Okay, what will happen if we actually minimize this? This is our, what, this is this linear, this first order approximation to our objective. What happens if we minimize this first order approximation? Then we're gonna get way over here. Okay, this is very bad. Why is this bad? Because this linear approximation is only good around WT. Right? Over here, this linear approximation is actually pretty good. Over here, it's horrible. So what we want to do is we want to minimize our linear approximation, but still stay close to WT. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to minimize uh, this uh, regularized objective, which is our linear approximation, plus some term that says we're not going to allow to get too far away from WT. How do we measure that? And this is the important thing here. We're going to measure that using the, great, the, the Euclidean norm. And this is uh, where the Euclidean norm regularization appears in uh, in, in uh, gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. And when you do this, this is now a quadratic, you can solve it, and, and what you get is exactly the, the gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent uh, update, depending on if GT is your gradient or stochastic gradient estimate. Okay? okay, so that means that stochastic gradient descent is specifically works on the Euclidean geometry. And so maybe it shouldn't be surprising that if we use stochastic gradient descent, we get generalization properties in terms of the Euclidean geometry, in terms of the Euclidean norm of W. Okay? Can we go uh, beyond Euclidean geometry? Okay, so, and so far, we saw that our, our psi, our, our bias, was all given by the, the Euclidean norm of W. 
But what about if you want to use a different, you know, L1 norm, the trace norm, you know, some group K7 norm or something like that, okay? Okay, so we have some, uh, uh, some regularizer psi. Uh, then at least if we take an explicit approach, it's pretty clear what we should do. Uh, what we should do is either, you know, constrain our psi, look at the sublevel set, or uh, maybe use this regularized formulation, minimize the empirical risk, and sorry, change notation, you know, uh, this substitute S is the empirical, you know, change the, the, the empirical objective on the uh, empirical risk or empirical objective on the sample, plus, uh, uh, plus some, uh, the regularization psi, okay? And if we do this, um, then in fact, uh, uh, we can get good generalization. So in, in particular, if psi is one strongly convex with respect to some norm, then we get generalization, which depends on psi of this predictor we're competing with, and the norm of the gradients of f in the dual norm uh, that to, to, with respect to which psi is uh, strongly convex. We'll see how this works out uh, in a second. But we can get some generalization. This comes, uh, so in this case, for, for supervised learning, this is why there's an L here and F here, for supervised learning uh, problems, we can get this for uniform convergence. We can actually get this for any convex problem. Uh, I think I'm not, I think Sasha and Peter didn't cover that. I don't think they covered this. We can actually get this for any convex problem, but then we can rely on uniform convergence. We have to rely on stability. So it's different arguments, but still, the result of explicit regularization. Okay, how can we, what, what would be the analog of stochastic gradient descent here? How can we get the same type of regularization just by running some optimization algorithm? So the right optimization algorithm to run in this case, um, uh, where is it? Uh, it's up here, okay. The right optimization algorithm to run in this case uh, would be uh, mirror descent or dual averaging or uh, if you took uh, my class is the way I would describe it is for the regularized linearized leader. Okay, it's all the same algorithm. Okay, what is it? So what we're doing, the, the easiest to think, to think about it is we have all these gradients that we collected. So each one of them provides some linear approximation of our function. We're going to average all of them. So we're going to get this average of first order approximation of our function. Okay, and we're going to uh, optimize this linear as the, uh, this average linear approximation with, uh, with the regularization term that depend, the, the, that's given by this psi, okay? What this boils down to uh, is also given by this maybe more familiar form of uh, mirror descent, uh, which looks kind of similar to the gradient descent we had before, that each time we're taking a step where we're, we're only looking at the linear approximation around W, uh, we're um, only looking at the linear approximation of Wt, and now the way we have to look at how you know, how far we're moving is in terms of the Bregman divergence associated with, with Psi. But I don't want to tell you what the Bregman divergence is. I don't like the Bregman divergence. The Bregman divergence involves the dual, and I think I promised somebody this is going to be a dual-free talk, okay? So I wrote here the definition of Bregman divergence just because I knew somebody would ask me what is the Bregman divergence. Like people insist on asking what is the path norm, but actually I'm not, I don't want you to think about the Bregman divergence, okay? So how actually should you think about these things? Okay, so uh, so let's think about the, uh, so this is the mirror descent we saw before and involves this uh, Bregman divergence, which I don't like, okay? Uh, but let's think of what happens here if we take, so at each step we're gonna minimize, we're gonna look at a linear approximation, and minimize the linear approximation plus this divergence term. So let's look at a second order approximation of this divergence term. So if you look at the second order approximation of this divergence term, uh, what it comes down to is just this quadratic norm given by the Hessian of Psi, okay? So now if I solve this, uh, so now this is just a quadratic and I can solve this, and what I get is this update in which instead of just going in the direction of, uh, uh, of f, I go in the direction of f w skewed by the Hessian of Psi. Okay? Now note that this is kind of a, a more correct in two ways. So gradient descent, think of gradient descent as you're just taking a step in the direction of the gradient, is a completely wrong thing. Because the gradient, you're, you're optimizing in some space, so think of this as, you know, space of uh, column vectors. And the gradient, what's the gradient? The gradient is not a, a vector. The gradient is a, is a, is a linear, is a, is in a dual space. It's a, yeah, that's why I don't like a dual, right? But the linear, the gradient is, is a linear functional on your space. It's actually, if, if your uh, optimization iterates are, are uh, column vectors, the gradient is a row vector, okay? So what you're doing, if you're just saying, I'm adding the gradient to my iterate, you're adding a row vector and a column vector, and all your gradient uh, descent code should really not refuse to compile because you're adding row vectors and column vectors, okay? So what you really should be doing is one of two things. Either thinking about it this way, this is fine, this is correct, because now um, we're, 
we're using the gradient here only as it, the way you know, God intended us to use the gradient as a, li a linear function of an uh, if, and we're multiplying a row vector and a column vector. And now what we're, uh, what we're doing is we're just minimizing this plus a proximity term, but this, the way we're measuring the local geometry is, now, now we're, we're measuring geometry, but the geometry is local. And this Hessian of Psi determines our local geometry. It tells us at each location which directions are expensive to go in and which directions are cheap to go in. Okay? Or this is equivalent to thinking of it this way, and now we have an explicit transformation here mapping our uh, row vector to a column vector, okay? and, and it's just a gradient descent. This happens to be an identity for some particular choice of basis. Okay, good. Uh, but this is still not, so this, uh, in this update rule is, is known as natural gradient descent. So you can think of natural gradient descent as a second order approximation to uh, mirror descent. Okay, but then this makes this fairly intuitive, but how do we get to, to I mean, I mean, why do I need this if I'm only looking at approximation? So in order to see that, let's think of what happens here if we take the step size to zero. So this is all in discrete time. Let's move from discrete time to continuous time. So we're going to take the step size to zero. So instead uh, uh, of these discrete updates, these boils down to a, a, an ODE, right? where the ODE is given where the, the, uh, the, the derivative of W with respect to T, so W dot, is proportional to exactly the right-hand side here, the uh, gradient uh, transformed by the, by the Hessian of Psi. Okay, so this, and this is valid for either one of these. I mean, both of them have the same limit when uh, the step size goes to zero. So when the step size goes to zero, mirror descent and, and natural gradient descent are the same. Okay, but the thing is we do actually care about discrete time because we're using discrete computers, we're running things for you know, a discrete number of steps and we do care about how many steps we run. Okay, so rather than starting from this and going to this ODE, the way I want you to think about mirror descent is start from this ODE. And, and, and the reason I want you to think about that again, I want to emphasize the, the, the geometry and to me here the geometry is very explicit. So this, psi, this Hessian of Psi specifies the local geometry very explicitly. Okay? So now there's this ODE and we need to discretize it. So how do you discretize this ODE? Well, the simplest thing to do is do a kind of a forward Euler uh, discretization. What does this boil down to is thinking of this ODE as kind of this piecewise linear ODE. So we take every, um, can I, where's my whiteboard here? Um, So we took this ODE, and the solution to the ODE is you know, some you know, smooth path. And instead what we do is for, any, for every uh, time step of length uh, uh, tau, okay, uh, we, fix the, uh, we fix the right hand side here. Okay? So that, that means that we take, you know, for tau we take uh, you know, a step in a, in a fixed direction, and then here we take a step in a fixed direction, and here we take a step in a fixed direction, and so forth. Okay? So is this, is this discretization clear? So we're, we're only changing our right-hand side every tau time. Okay, in this, uh, if you um, solve this ODE, okay, since what you're doing is just taking a, a step every tau time, this is exactly natural gradient descent. Okay, how do you get mirror descent? So that's a better discretization. What we're going to do is we're going to discretize this part just the same, but we're not going to discretize this at all. Okay, so what we're going to do is this. We're going to look at a discretization of the, of the gradient of our objective, because our objective, f, is something we actually need to ask about. We, it's, it's a complicated function, we don't know it. So every tau time, we're gonna query a gradient of our objective, okay? But psi is something that we already know, it's maybe easy for us to work with, so we're gonna leave this undiscretized and change this continuously. So in, instead of getting this piecewise linear thing, you're gonna get something which is, it's piecewise uh, smooth, I can't draw it, I can't draw piecewise smooth things, it's piecewise smooth, maybe look something like this, because each piece here, okay, corresponds to still solving this ODE, just where, where the red part is fixed and the, the green part is still time dependent. Okay? And if you look at this discretization, this discretization is exactly equivalent to mirror descent. It's just another way to derive mirror descent. So another way to think about mirror descent is it's a better discretization of this ODE. Why better discretization? Because we're discretizing it less. Okay? And, and so this is one thing of one mirror descent is, is better than natural gradient descent. In particular, to actually get good performance guarantees, we have to discretize in this way and not in this way. Okay? But both of them just stem, can be derived directly from this OD. So here, I mean, the reason I like this is this, there's no dual here, no Bregman divergence. The, the geometry is very explicit here, just the discretization of using this local geometry. 
Okay, great. So this is, yes? This discretization that gives mirror descent, can I find that with different letters in a numerical analysis book, or is that something? That That's a good question. I don't know. If you do, so this is, uh, I should say, this was derived by uh, Surya and myself. Uh, what? It might exist somewhere in the literature. It, we don't know. I mean, we, we, we talked about it to, I mean, you know, it's not something very sophisticated, right? Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen it before. I can tell you it arose actually when I had to explain mirror descent to physicists. And, you know, I, I, I didn't even try going into the duel, right? Uh, so, uh, so in order to explain mirror descent to physicists, you know, you, you, you should start with an OD. Uh, I, um, I don't know. I would be very happy to hear if it appears before. I have not uh, seen it. Maybe you independently before. What? Um, no, maybe you just want to say the word Riemann or <laughs> Riemannian descent or something. <laughs> Riemannian oh, th This, you want to refer to this as Riemannian gradient? Yes. So this is right. So this is uh, the reason I'm not. Okay. So what the, the word seven wants me to say is I'm looking here at gradient descent on some Riemannian manifold uh, with the local geometry given by, uh, by Psi. I'm willing to say that. Uh, the reason I'm not, uh, I, I don't feel, frankly, I, I don't feel comfortable enough uh, in my own understanding of uh, remaining uh, manifolds in order to say that. That's the only. I mean, it's just that. Yeah, it's just that, but like I. <laughs> this is a Riemannian manifold. It is a Riemannian manifold, but I, yeah. yeah. This is also a little bit of a simplification of mirror descent because from what I see, this view only holds for unconstrained. That's true. Yeah. So that's a, that's a very good question. And that's, a, that's a very good point. So this is only for unconstrained optimization. In fact, uh, I'm only going to be talking about unconstrained optimization today. Uh, and, and it's a good question whether you can, and I think the answer is yes, but we haven't worked it out, whether you can get a similar view also for uh, constrained mirror descent. Maybe you know uh, other... Then you cannot because Psi won't be differentiable at the uh, boundary of the set because then you would have this regularizer plus the indicator of the set. Uh, okay, so I'm thinking of uh, constraints. Okay, I guess the constraints I'm thinking of is a constraint to the simplex, where I'm constraining myself to, so, it's, so I don't have issues of boundary, but rather I'm constraining myself to a lower dimensional uh, manifold. And in that case, I think things are differentiable. So, yeah, I mean, so, I'm, like so I'm, I'm not sure, is the short answer. Okay, yes? What would happen if the Hessian of the side is lower? Can I uh, then, uh, so, so for now, it's not going to be low rank because we said that psi is to be strongly convex. And if it's low rank, that this is uh, undetermined, and actually we'll get to a situation like that in a second. But for now, we're talking about psi being uh, strongly convex, and so the Hessian of psi is full rank. Okay, uh, so this is the, what I did here is for, for batch gradient descent. What happens with stochastic gradient descent? Or uh, sorry, batch mirror descent. What happens with stochastic mirror descent? So um, for stochastic mirror descent, I, I have the same thing uh, you know, it's just that every time I'm instead of taking the full gradient, I'm just taking the uh, the gradient with respect to uh, a, on a single in, uh, a single observation zt. And again, I can talk about the second order approximation. The second order approximation gives me the natural gradient descent. They're both going to have the same limit when the step size goes to zero. And what is going to be this limit if we take the step size to zero? Okay, so what do we, what do we get here? So again, we, we, we take the, the same type of thing. Now we, we take smaller and smaller steps, so smaller and steps in time. Okay? So what's going on is that not only are we having finer and finer discretization, but we're also using more and more and more samples. Because in the same time scale, right, I'm, I'm going to be using 1 over tau in, in, in one time, I'm going to be using 1 over tau samples. So the number of samples is going to go to infinity here. And the, uh, the continuous limit, we lost all stochasticity. The continuous limit is just uh, gradient flow in the population. Okay. So how can we, but what we want to do is go back. What we want to go is actually start from this is, and derive back stochastic gradient center, stochastic natural descent. So it's a question, Surya? Okay. Um, okay, so what we have to do here is in the discretization, explicitly discretize not only the, lin the linearization, but also explicitly discretize the, the stochasticity. And we can do this, so we can define this uh, uh, stochastic natural gradient descent and stochastic mirror descent, or be particularly interested in stochastic mirror descent, as a discretization of this uh, gradient flow in the population. So now, also, every tau time, not only are we updating our gradient estimate, but every tau time, we're also using a different example. Okay? So I, I think this is a, an, an important view to keep in mind, and it comes in, in, in some uh, recent work, which also suggests why well, I mean, we said we wanted the, the connection to optimization here. So how do you want to choose this, this uh, geometry? We want to choose this geometry so that the, the ODE is as straight as possible. Okay? So if this is the place we're going to end up with, we prefer going this way 
than going kind of something like this, okay? Because if we go something like this, it's going to be harder to discretize. We're going to have to need more discretization steps, okay? If we go like this, we're going to need less discretization steps. But also, I think if we think of it as stochasticity, then we can understand why it's also very important that our, our path is short. So, we said before, that I'm going to go, you know, I want to choose an, 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 the, the optimization such that I'm going to get to a, to a, I'm going to get to a nearby beach and I want to kind of get there. It's good for me when my optimization is such that I'm going to get to the optimum quickly. Why is it good? It's, it's intuitively, it's good also in terms of generalization because if I have, if I have a short way of getting somewhere or a very long way of getting somewhere, okay, in this short way of getting somewhere, I can have fewer, uh, use fewer examples okay? and along the way and still the variance introduced by the stochasticity is not going to be very high. If I have a very very long path okay, then I'm going to have to now have many many more uh, 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 use many more and more samples. Remember that each one of these steps I also have to use in, in another sample in order to get the same roughly variance of the path. Okay? So in fact in, 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 we could study sample complexity by, and I don't know exactly how to do this, I mean, in, in general, but we could consider studying some complexity by studying, starting with this OD on the population. The OD on the population goes to population optimum, and now we can ask how much we have to discretize the stochasticity in order to still get something that goes close enough to the OD on the population. And that will tell us how many samples we need in order to optimize the population, which is our goal. Okay, let's, yes? I understand your point, but Instead of getting to a single point, you're getting to some space. Right? Yeah, you're right. So I'm not getting, oh, okay, no, no, no. So, so two comments. One is, I thought what you meant. I'll get back to what you actually said. I thought what you meant, and that's true. I don't actually getting, care about getting to the population optimum. Really what I ask is, how long will it take me to get to a neighborhood, an epsilon neighborhood of population optimum, and then I have to make sure that my path after the, after the, the, the stochasticity would still get to this neighborhood. I think what, what you're actually asking is before I was talking about this underdetermined situation, um, and now uh, the, on the population objective, the problem is not underdetermined. The problem is underdetermined only on the sample because I have many more, many fewer samples than parameters. But in the population, the problem is, is nicely fully determined. Okay, so the population optimum is unique or well defined at least, or at least any population object, uh, optimum is good for me. Equal good. Okay, so the game here, uh, okay, maybe the last question because I, sure. I, I didn't quite understand uh, this point about the length of the path. Okay, I didn't either. Uh, we're just still trying to figure it out. So, 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 for example, momentum methods, they will have longer paths because of all okay. the shifting. Okay, so in fact, in fact, I don't understand momentum methods. And, uh, I, and we tried to talk about this, I think, before. And um, I... I don't. Um, I don't completely. I, 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 there's been lots. Uh, so there's been lots of work uh, on understanding uh, so sort of non-stochastic deterministic discrete optimization methods by uh, uh, using this discre these discretizations, okay? um, and in particular understanding momentum methods in this context. Okay, what I'm suggesting here, and I'm just giving context here. What I'm suggesting here is trying to understand stochastic uh, methods, in particular the sample complexity, also using discretization. And the comment is that the length of the path is not really the important thing, be maybe, because in momentum methods, if you look at the, 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 the type of path that you can add, you, that corresponds to adding momentum, it's actually a crazier path. And in fact, that's why I don't completely understand the derivation of the momentum methods uh, using uh, discretization. So you're right that the, the length of the path is not like the, the, the time is meaningless. I can always get faster and shorter time just by, right? Um, so you, this is why I, I, I didn't actually do this, right? So I, this is, I mean, we can talk about it later and try to understand what's going on here. Okay, let's go back to the geometry. So the, the game here is what we want is to match, uh, to find a geometry that matches our problem, okay? So what geometry would match our problem the best? Uh, well, I can tell you that I actually know the objective function. There's a very clear geometry, which is the best geometry, which is what? Using, using just psi equals f. So if you use psi equals f, then uh, natural gradient descent corresponds to Newton method, which is not bad. Mirror descent would be much better. Mirror descent would just be done in one iteration. Okay? So that's definitely the best thing you can do. Okay? Unfortunately, we usually don't know our objective because otherwise we don't need to optimize at all. And so we have some uncertainty. And what we want is to find a psi that kind of matches our sense of the problem as best as we can. So the way we should think of it is, is, is roughly as follows. 
we, do, we don't know where the optimum is. We don't know where W is, okay? But we have maybe some sense. This is our, our, our kind of prior knowledge. This, uh, think of this as our hypothesis class that we want to capture, okay? Now, if you prefer thinking of like you know, some complexity measure, then maybe this is not a fixed hypothesis class, but you have some complexity measure that finds a hierarchy of hypothesis classes. It's not so important. The game here is that we want to find a, a, a psi that's strongly convex, that is as small as possible, and is you know, strongly convex and easy to work with, that's as small as possible, roughly speaking, but still captures W. So think if the sublevel set of psi might look something like this, this is pretty good. We capture our, 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 uh, the models we really want to capture pretty well. Okay? Now to understand the complexity, what we have to go is we have to go to the, now unfortunately we do have to go to the dual in some sense. What we have to do is think this is strongly convex with respect to some norm. And now we have to, to see how can we capture the, the gradients of our objective in the dual norm for which this is strongly convex with respect to. And that's what's going to determine the complexity. So the balance of the value of psi on the w's and the evaluation of the dual norm on the gradients. Okay? Okay. And I should say that this view is in some sense general and universal in the following sense, that if you have a problem that's specified by some plausible region of W's and possible set of, uh, uh, of gradients, then the approach we just saw is optimal, meaning that you can always get the, the, the min-max optimal sample complexity, okay, uh, in, in some sense, uh, by, cons by choosing the right psi. There always exists some psi that will give you the min-max optimal complexity, both uh, you either when you use it as, uh, as uh, uh, implicitly for in the optimization algorithm, namely in, in mirror descent with respect to that psi, or as an explicit regularizer. Okay, so let's let's maybe see it um, a bit more uh, concretely. So we said that our complexity looks something like this. We have to choose a psi that balances those two things, and the gradient of f, at least for supervised learning problems, the gradient of f basically just boils to uh, the, the data points. The gradient of f is, is just x if, uh, if we have. Uh, 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 um, a linear predictor, and so really you should think about it that we want to look at psi of uh, the, the W star you want to compete with, and the dual norm on the data, okay? Uh, and so the standard choice is to choose the Euclidean geometry, so if we work in the Euclidean geometry, uh, the sample complexity is given by the squared, uh, squared norm of W times the squared norm of X, okay? That's fine. So changing the geometry now corresponds to, I mean, the easiest way to think of a change in geometry is a geometry that's, you know, where the Hessian is fixed everywhere, so it's just a, a different quadratic geometry, different you know, Euclidean geometry on a different basis. Uh, so that's given by psi, which has this quadratic form, okay? And that means that when we can think of this as preconditioned graining descent, right? When we do graining descent, we use a fixed transformation Q, so we just you know, work with a different basis. Uh, and now our sample complexity is going to be given by uh, the Q norm of W and the Q inverse norm of X. Okay, so now if you think of what's the best Q to work with, you want to find a, a, if you, have, you want to find a, 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 an ellipsoid Q that captures your uh, that kind of fits the uh, fits your prior notion about W uh, well, and that its dual fits uh, uh, you know contains the data well, roughly speaking. Okay, okay. so this is kind of uh, uh, still quadratic geometries, but we can do that with other geometries. So, uh, for example, you can look at uh, LP norms, and uh, so the LP uh, norm, uh, the squared LP norm is not one strongly convex with respect to the LP norm. To make it one strongly convex, you have to scale it this way, so you have to take one over P, o P minus one times the squared LP norm. That is strongly convex with respect to the LP norm. And so the sample convex you get is the uh, LP uh, the LP norm of W, the dual norm of the uh, data, so that you know, makes sense, divided by P minus 1. Okay. So this is also fine, but the problem, the, the interesting case is the L1 norm. And the L1 norm, P equals 1, doesn't work here, because for the L1 norm, the denominator the, the number goes to infinity. Okay. We get, uh, or it goes to 0, the, the whole thing explodes. Okay. And this is really the most interesting case. How do we handle the L1 geometry? So there are two approaches here, or there are many approaches. One approach is we can actually take an LP norm where P is very close to 1. Okay? P is roughly 1 over log D is good enough. Okay? Uh, but, sorry? 1 plus 1 over log D. 1, one plus 1 over log D, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but the, the other approach is to take this entropic uh, uh, potential. So if you take uh, Psi to be instead of the L1 norms, just sum of the WIs, instead of taking sum of the WI log WI, okay? um, uh, then this is one strongly convex uh, the, at least in the restriction of, uh, of the space with bounded well norm. And what we get here is the sample complexity is going to behave as 
the gun pin on L1 norm and then infinity norm times log D. So this is a familiar sample complexity for L1 norm. And again, we said this is going to be optimal. But I want to focus on the geometry here. So what, what happens here, again, we can view it in terms of the ODE. And if you just look, you know, it all just boils down to calculating the Hessian of Psi and, uh, and plugging it in. If you calculate the Hessian of Psi, the Hessian of Psi is the diagonal of 1 over W. Okay? And so we get uh, an OD that looks like this. So in each coordinate, instead of uh, uh, the gradient determined by the, the DDT determined by the gradient, DDT is determined by W times the gradient. So what we're doing is multiplicative weights, right? Where every time we're, we're multiplying our update by the current value of W. And this exactly boils down to multiplicative weights. Okay, so what we saw here is we, we changed our, uh, what, what you're supposed to get from this part um, uh, of, uh, uh, of the tutorial is I'm trying to explain what I mean by geometry and how by changing the geometry of the optimization, right? So this geometry uh, psi of the optimization, we're getting uh, inductive biases in terms of generalization in terms of different qu quantities that correspond to this, uh, uh, to this geometry. Okay. Now, and this goes back maybe to the question of what happens if psi is not strongly convex. So all this, all the theoretical analysis rests on psi being uh, strongly convex, which means that the geometry is well conditioned everywhere. Okay. But you know, maybe we can throw that off the door. Instead of that, just say, oh, well, really, the simple way to interpret all this is what do I do at each step? I and mean, this is maybe going, and uh, OD is a continuous version of this. But what happens in each step is I want to take an infinitesimal step. And I want to do an infinitesimal step in two things. I want to take an infinitesimal step that improves the objective as much as possible. So this is captured by my linear approximation or approximate linear approximation. And is also small. Okay, so I want to take like a, a step that it can be, and I want to make the most progress in the least sized step. And the question is, how do I measure small step? Okay, so this is where the geometry comes in. Okay, so before we measured small step in terms of, and I'm going to back, we measure stop, small step in terms of this uh, uh, Euclidean distance given by, uh, sorry, a local distance, local Riemannian distance here, I said it, given by Q, okay? But now you can say, well, maybe I have any type of measure distance, doesn't even have to be distance, any type of way of, of saying what, how big a step is, how big is WT, uh, uh, is how, you know, a step from W to WT is. And I can just define my step as taking each iteration, a step that's small in terms of this delta and makes the most progress. And that's well defined, and that's called steepest descent. And again, you can think of it as, as a generalization of uh, mirror descent where uh, we threw analysis out the door. Okay? Okay. Uh, and in this case, so if we take the Euclidean distance, uh, maybe we should say Euclidean distance square here, okay? uh, then what we get back is exactly gradient descent, because that's what we saw before. Uh, and now we can get things that are definitely not strongly convex. And again, the most interesting thing to take is, is, steep, is uh, the L1 norm. Okay? And, and now, what do I get now if I do uh, steep descent with respect to L1 norm? So again, so I want to take a step that's smallest in terms of the L1 norm and makes the most progress. Okay? The way to do that is to just use a single coordinate and, up, and, and put all my money on a single coordinate, okay? So that boils down to coordinate descent, okay? And now I want to emphasize that coordinate descent is not well-defined, okay? Because, exactly because this distance is not strongly convex. In what sense is it not well-defined? I might have ties, right? There might be multiple ways of making the same amount of progress, okay, on different coordinates. So I have two coordinates that both have the same partial derivatives. I can make the same amount of, of progress if I choose one coordinate or the other coordinate or any combination of them. So there are actually many different valid coordinate descent paths. Okay, so that's what happens if you don't have strong convexity. Okay, um, okay. but, and so whenever we say, and we're gonna say coordinate descent quite a bit in this talk, and you should keep in mind that whenever you're saying coordinate descent, it's actually ill-defined. Okay, it's, I, we, we might sum coordinate descent. Okay, um, you can also do this for other non-strong uh, non convex uh, uh, distance measures like the L infinity norm, and what you get here is kind of this, uh, just looking at taking a step in the direction only the sign of the gradients, okay? Okay, um, okay, so what do we have, uh, okay, so what do we see so far? So what we saw so far, you might be wondering why, you know, what is the, maybe somebody even asked this, what is the connection between everything I told you now and all the motivation I had in the beginning? Because in the beginning, um, uh, so what we saw so far is I call this implicit regularization, but it's very, really very different. The, the, the implicit regularization is really, to get this implicit regularization, it was important that we're doing a one-pass stochastic method. Okay, so you can think of that as kind of early stopping. We're not optimizing to convergence. We did not get the training error down to zero, right? So after this one pass, we said we're not at the empirical risk minimizer, okay? We still have substantial training error, okay? And the number of iterations in particular is equal to the number of data points, okay? 
This is very different from the phenomena we saw at the beginning, which is a phenomena where we either use some batch method or we use maybe stochastic gradient descent. We use many, many paths of stochastic gradient descent and actually drove down the optimization to zero. That's not what we saw so far. Okay? Or it's not even this, it's not, you can think of it also in the boosting example we mentioned. Boosting can be viewed as, uh, so at a boost at least, is a batch coordinate descent method. So what it does is does uh, uh, coordinate descent, but it's batch coordinate descent, not stochastic coordinate descent. So again, all this discussion we had so far is kind of irrelevant for, uh, uh, for Ada boost. Okay? Um, and again, the, the, the performance of the, the this sort of behavior of Ada boost we see is after the training error was, was zero. So, um, so what we're going to turn to, maybe we'll take the break a few minutes earlier, like two minutes earlier, it's fine. What we're going to turn to after the break is we're going to still talk about uh, um, uh, convex problems, but now still talk about convex problems. But now we're going to turn from this stochastic optimization where we get the implicit regularization by virtue of early stopping, and uh, and instead turn to these underdetermined problems where we are going to optimize using batch or some other method all the way down, and we're going to see how how that also gives us good enough uh, uh, inductive bias to allow generalization. So let me just, before uh, we go to the break, just maybe justify w why did we do all this? Because what we're going to see is this, so the main thing I hope you got from all this is this connection between a geometry and optimization. Oh, I should have had this, my slide and this disappeared. Okay, so this connection between optimization, geometry, and uh, learning. Okay, so the optimization, since what we're talking about is just local, all the optimization algorithms I know are basically local search optimization algorithms, definitely anything we're going to talk about. And so when this local, the, the algorithm is determined by the geometry, uh, you know, the difference between the algorithms boil down to different geometries that we're working with. How do I measure the small step size? And also for a learning problem, really what we should care about is what is this geometry of this hypothesis space? How does it look like? Does it look like a Euclidean ball? Does it look like a, a simplex? Does it, you know, what is this geometry in the space? And we say, we saw that good things happen when the geometry of the Euclidean, if the optimization problem matches the, the geometry of the learning problem. In particular, we have, we're using, we're doing gradient, we're doing optimization with respect to some geometry, and we get generalization with respect to the hypothesis class defined by that geometry. And I'm using here geometry very, very loosely, which is also maybe why I'd rather not use the term Riemannian geometry, because I don't think that would have been correct, what I just said. Okay, uh, so we'll take a break, and after the break, we'll, uh, uh, which I said we'll tell you how long it'll be, we'll turn to these undetermined problems. <laughs>